Hi everyone, welcome to Kindred Skulls. I'm Matt Fries, and I'll be doing a solo podcast today. Um, obviously, it's been a little bit since we released an episode. I think the last one we got out was back in June. I, I think it was actually the uh, discussing Justin Jefferson's contract. Um, but with the season coming up, we wanted to get something out. And I wanted to start with a little update on the show, and then we'll get into the Vikings and the upcoming season there. Um, so, obviously, if you're a fan of the show, you'll know that, unfortunately, we weren't able to get together very much over the course of the last offseason. Uh, and the three of us kind of kept it getting busy at alternating times, right? It'd be like, one of us has the ability to go, and then two of us can't kind of make it. Um so it, that's kind of continued as we get towards the season. And for a little while, I'm going to be doing solo podcasts. Um, I, I say a little while. It's pretty much indefinite. Maybe we'll get Nick back, um, you know, kind of towards the second half of the season. We'll see how that goes. Uh, moving forward, Greg isn't really going to be a regular on the show. He has some other projects that he's really excited about that he kind of wants to focus more of his time on. So he's going to kind of step aside and do that. Maybe we'll try to get Greg back for, you know, some special episodes or something like that once a year sort of thing. But, um, you know, generally he's decided he kind of wants to focus his time on other areas, which is totally cool. Love you, Greg. Uh, I, honestly, he, he does kind of some small time film stuff and puts out some really impressive products there. Um, Nick, on the other hand, has been really busy too, uh, particularly with work. Uh, I'm, Try not to air out too much, but he's switching. He's in the process of switching jobs. So he's really got a lot on his plate right now. And he also has kids, which I don't have kids. I can't imagine the amount of time it takes uh, with what we do with the heavy film prep, right? Um, you know, I, I feel like during the season that I don't have a life outside of doing football stuff, right? Like, I, I do, but, like, I, I really feel like my free time is pretty limited. And Nick, with his demanding job, on top of having kids, like, I really don't know how he found the time to do this and record every week. So we're going to see. Hopefully things settle down with him, uh, and he'll jump back in on things. He's certainly always welcome to come back on the show as we uh, as we move forward here, you know, and, and maybe things will settle down in the season and we'll start having a two man show kind of every week during the season. But for right now, I'm going to be going solo on the pod uh, for the foreseeable future. I'll try to get this show out, probably record Wednesday night to release kind of a Thursday morning release every single week. Um, might be able to be a little bit more regular on the schedule since it's just me doing it. Generally, my Wednesdays are pretty free. Uh so, you know, one person kind of kills the name a little bit, right? We got Kindred Skulls. Uh, we don't we don't really have the uh, skulls to match. But uh, longtime listeners, listeners of the show will know we already changed the name once. So it is what it is. We're going to keep the name. We're going to keep it rolling. And I'm really hopeful that you guys will like what I'm able to provide by myself here on Kindred Skulls for the time being. Um, so with all that, Let's dive into the Vikings. Uh, just for this episode, I'm going to start by going over some of the preseason excitement, right? Talk about some of the maybe lesser known players on the roster, then go over the 53 man roster in general, go over the total team outlook, and then dive into the Giants game. So let's get into it. Um, first, right? The Vikings preseason. I mean, I think the story of the preseason was young defensive linemen stepping up and really having nice games, right? Uh, you saw Taki Taimani, um, Levi Drake Rodriguez probably got the most press out of everybody. I was most impressed by Taki Taimani, and I was also really impressed by Jalen Redmond. Um, and all three of those players made the team kind of a little bit to my surprise, right? Uh, in years past, we'd seen other players, and granted, they were veterans. Uh, last year was Sheldon Day. The year before, it was T.Y. McGill really show out in preseason. And there, there's a little bit of, you know, question to that, right? As a defensive lineman in preseason, you're not necessarily going up against the best offensive lineman in the world, right? So maybe even if they're able to flash and get in the backfield, it could be due to mistakes from the opposing offense or just players who aren't very good. So our evaluation in the preseason that they're showing out and really making plays may not mean much in the grand scheme of things. And we kind of saw that with Day and McGill, where McGill didn't even make the team. And I believe he went to the 49ers later that year. You know, he's never really been a consistent long-term player. Teams haven't seen that in them. Sheldon Day stuck around last year, but he was on the practice squad and then only played for a little bit during the season. 
Um, I'm not going to say that Taimani, Redmond, or Levi Drake Rodriguez are going to make immediate impacts, but I think it's notable that all three are pretty young defensive linemen, right? McGill and Day had been around for a little while when they showed out where obviously Levi Drake Rodriguez, raw seventh round pick out of uh, Texas A&M Commerce, Taki Taimani, undrafted free agent out of Oregon, Jalen Redmond uh, went to Oklahoma, but he was actually playing in the UFL. This last year, he's one of the betters in the UFL, and they signed him off of that. So, you know, younger players who don't have a lot of NFL experience, I'm a little bit more hyped about them. And the fact that they made the Vikings 53-man roster and the fact that they cut Jaquel and Roy, who was somebody who I didn't think played all that poorly, really, during the preseason. Like, I don't think he was phenomenal, but he was a fifth-round draft pick. And then he didn't he wasn't, like, a complete disaster during the preseason makes me hopeful for them. Now, do I think that they're going to make significant impacts young right away? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say that's the case. Uh, you know, you have obviously Harrison Phillips and Jonathan Bullard are going to be your starters, and they add a run defense for that I think is pretty impressive. Uh, Jerry Tillery, it sounds like, is kind of going to be a rotational starter. I don't have a lot of faith in Jerry Tillery personally. So, you know, if we think, if the Viking staff ends up thinking that Jalen Redmond and Levi Drake Rodriguez can give them a little bit more pass rush juice than what Jerry Tillery does and, and maybe a little bit more all-around play than what Jerry Tillery can provide eventually. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me, but I, out the gate, I don't think we're going to see significant contributions. I think it was simply that all three of those players really played well enough during the preseason that they earned a roster spot and weren't somebody you wanted to expose to waivers, right, where another team could decide to pick them up and roster them. Um, so I wanted to jump into those guys first, but I'll jump into the 53 man roster a little bit. Obviously it's been out for like a week and a half. So there's a pretty significant amount of analysis on it, but I was very happy with how I did just to toot my own horn a little bit here on my own 53 man roster. Um, I got 50 out of 53 players and the guys I miss Jalen Redmond, I had noted as a practice squad player, but really was somebody I wanted to keep. And I, you know, kept Andre Carter over him who ended up getting cut and was on the practice squad just because I thought the Vikings investment in Carter would make them keep him. Um, Brian Asimov and Lewis seen, I had Lewis seen on my roster and Brian Asimov off the roster. I honestly think that the Vikings still could have flipped it. It was just, they had much better depth at safety. So they ended up uh, cutting Lewis seen and keeping Brian Asimov. I don't really feel too bad about missing that one. Um, as from why I do think has special teams value for this team. I, I really thought, you know, he made a couple nice plays in the preseason, but he's still just way too up and down. Like instinctually, I, I'm not sure it's fully there for him where he's consistently making the right decisions that he needs to on defense. Um, the, the third one I got wrong was I had Kenny Wongwu on the team, right? Because I thought he was kind of, kind of, you know, solidified in as the kick returner. Obviously, the team thinks otherwise. It looks like it's going to be Ty Chandler as the kick returner. And I only kept eight offensive linemen on my initial 53-man roster just because I didn't think anybody on the lower end of the roster really had earned that spot. The Vikings decided to keep Michael Jurgens, who maybe he was a late sixth-round pick. He was either... No, maybe he was the seventh-round pick. It was Jurgens and then Levi Drake Rodriguez, um, who... You know, I, I thought really, I, I kind of liked his tape at Wake Forest. Like, I, I wasn't, you know, maybe this guy is a future starter, but I, I thought I saw something there from him where he had the potential to be, but he really struggled in the preseason. And I think really Jurgens being on the roster is more of a result of Dalton Risner being injured and being on injured reserve for the first four weeks and him kind of being a roster stash as somebody they liked as a, um, is a draft pick and somebody they wanted to make sure they weren't exposing him to waivers too early. I, I think what we'll probably see with Jurgens is once Risner is able to get back, um, Jurgens probably gets cut, but gets taken back on the practice squad immediately, right? Kind of after those four weeks are up or whenever Risner is ready to play, because I don't think Jurgens is really ready to play in live football action right now. Um, for me, a team would keep eight active players on game day. And I, I, on the offensive line, and I would expect Jurgens to be inactive in most weeks. So he's on the roster for now, but I, I'm not sure that's going to last. But I think that there was, 
even some some good flashes from him in the preseason, particularly in the run game and power and kind of moving up, it was just the consistency wasn't there, right? And offensive line is all about being a consistent player. So, you know, Jurgens to me, I, as he grows as a player, you know, hopefully next year some of that stuff has been ironed out and in the preseason and we can see somebody who might be able to contribute as a backup swing interior guy or maybe even eventually take over as a starter. Um, one of the other big pieces of news, and, and again, this is very old news, right? We haven't recorded in three months, but, uh, both Lewis Seen and Andrew Booth, the first two picks from Quasi's inaugural draft, the 2022 draft, are out of the team. Obviously, Andrew Booth got traded for Nick Sean Wright of the Cowboys. Uh, Wright got cut and now he's on the practice squad. That was kind of what the expected outcome for him was for me. Um, I, I don't really love Nick Sean Wright as a player, but he's got great size. Um, so, and by great size, I mean, he's like six, four with a ridiculous wingspan. Uh, he, he was pretty skinny. Um, Booth did make the Cowboys, but that might be more due to injuries on the Cowboys than, than good play. I mean, there were, there was one pretty terrible play that Booth had, uh, where he got completely blocked out of bounds, wasn't in the play at all. And obviously Lewis seen, um, you know, un- unfortunately for him ended up getting cut by the Vikings as well. He had an okay Browns game and and one of the things with this Browns game right where he put up a lot of stats on the board is I was really hoping it would give him the confidence to read things out because I I think he was still hesitant in reading things particularly in coverage in that Browns game where he just wasn't trusting his eyes in terms of what he was seeing in front of him and it really just kind of imploded it on him on the Eagles game I thought as good of a game as he had against the Browns he kind of had that bad of a game against the Eagles, and, and that led to him being off the roster. The Vikings couldn't find a trade partner for him. That didn't really surprise me. Um, but one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, with Seen and Booth is both of them were guys I really liked coming out of school. Um, I was I was honestly stunned that the Vikings were able to get both of them. Obviously, infamously, they traded out of drafting potentially Kyle Hamilton at safety, or if they wanted to go defensive back, right? Like Trent McDuffie was still on the board. Obviously, he was an all-pro for the Chiefs last year. So they kind of moved out of both of those positions and ended up with Seen, who, uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. Like most of that Georgia defense, which was an absolutely incredible defense, obviously won the national championship this year, has not lived up to what they did in college at the NFL level. I, I'm sure, you know, that that sounds like it's a whole retrospective like feature 30 for 30 kind of deal that could be done on that but you know and and with seeing i i don't know if it was the injury if it was his ability to catch on to the defense right learn what was being taught you know obviously he he came from kirby smart system in georgia which is based in saban terminology right Uh, kirby smart is obviously was like saban's top lieutenant for a while before georgia hired him um, but the, uh, you know, so he comes from that, goes into the Donatel defense, which is a Fangio, Fangio defense, all sorts of different terminology, comes back into the Brian Flores defense, which is from Belichick, shares roots, I would say, with the Saban defense, but Flores, you know, runs a pretty significantly different system. So it could be the systems, you know, he get, got jerked around in a couple of those, wasn't able to pick them up. It could be, you know... Um, just hesitance from having a, a huge, huge injury, a, a very uh, difficult, probably painful and, and long rehab coming back from that badly broken leg that he suffered uh, over in the London game a couple of years ago. You know, it could be rehab from that, meaning he doesn't have the time on the field to be able to catch up in the way that he needed to. Um, but a, a couple of years out, right, I, I think there was still hesitance and he just wasn't seeing the field the way you kind of expected him to be able to coming out of school. Um, so there's there's certainly probably a lesson there to go back and, and see what was, you know, holding him back at Georgia uh, or, or what were possible red flags coming out of Georgia that turned out to be very impactful at the NFL level. And, and Booth is kind of a similar thing. Like Booth, I thought, had really, really exciting traits coming out of Clemson, and that's why I was so high on him. You could see him do high-level things that the best cornerbacks in the NFL do. The problem ended up being consistency once again. Like, whenever he's on the field, he was liable to get beat 
pretty much immediately by his opponent. He'd kind of overreact and jump on everything. So, you know, I, I think maybe the lesson for me with cornerbacks is to try to take a look into how they get beat on the field, right? If they're getting beat in kind of fluky ways where they still end up consistently in good position, uh, I, I think maybe that's less of a concern where if they're jumpy on things, they overreact to what your opponents are doing, or they just consistently end up out of position, uh, which I, I think was ultimately Booth's problem. And then there were probably some physicality tackling questions for him as well. Um, so obviously a, a huge L for the 2022 draft for Quisi Adolfo Mensa, a huge L for me personally, because I really liked that draft and I really liked both of those players uh, coming out of the draft, you know, but we're just going to need to uh, learn from it and move forward. Right. And, and Quisi talked a little bit in his recent press conference that he really felt like he tried to hit that draft out of the park, right? He was swinging for the fences and tried to hit everything perfectly. Okay. I'm going to trade back and I'm going to solve our safety issue. I'm going to solve our corner issue. I'm going to solve all of these issues at once. And it turns out that like none of the other guys he ended up taking hit. Right. So I think he was overconfident in his ability to evaluate and identify the correct players for what the team needed to do. Right. And I think it has influenced what he he was overconfident in his ability to get value in the draft to get the players of what he needed to do. Right. He thought, OK, we have this inside uh, edge because we really like Lewis Seen and we really like Andrew Booth and we really like Brian Asimov and we really like Ed Ingram. We're going to maneuver to make sure we get as many of those guys as possible. Well, that works great when those guys work out, but when they don't work out for whatever reason, if you misevaluated them, that doesn't work out as well. So you can either say, I want to get in on guys who I am more confident in my evaluation than I was on those, right, on the high level outcomes, or have more confidence that the evaluation is going to work out. And I think that's kind of what they did with Dallas Turner moving up, right? Like, I think they think Dallas Turner is a surefire and it all reports coming from Turner are that he was a surefire prospect who really had a low probability of missing. Um, now, that's a risky move, too. Obviously, they gave up a lot of assets to go up and get him. But I think the scattershot approach that he shows previously worked out so poorly that it kind of has changed his philosophy overall. So it'll be interesting to see how that philosophy moves over time. Because at the end of the day, as a GM, you have to hit on at least a couple drafts. You can miss a draft or two. Like, if you look at the history of general managers across the league, everybody has whiffed horribly on a draft, I'm pretty sure. I mean, John Snyder for the Seahawks, right, had a couple phenomenal drafts to start, like, the Legion of Boom era. Then went into, like, a four- or five-year cliff where they got no production out of their early-round players. And then later, they had a phenomenal draft where they got the, the Tariq Woolen year. I can't remember who else was in that draft, but I, I think like Charles Cross and um, the other tackle, Abraham Lucas, right? They got a lot of impact players on the year they made the playoffs two years ago out of that draft. So, you know, you're going to go up and down in waves in drafts, right? And obviously the 2023 draft looks okay, Um you know, the only major impact so far has been from Jordan Addison, but they didn't have a number of draft picks, right? They spent some of those draft picks on TJ Hawkinson, which has worked out phenomenally for the Vikings. Um, Makai Blackman was promising until he tore his ACL. And then the later round players, you know, you don't expect as much from them, but they got value in undrafted free agency and Ivan Pace, right? So 2023 looks pretty good on paper. It's not like an elite uh, team changing draft or anything like that, but it looks pretty good. And then 2024, Obviously, we'll have to wait and see with J.J. McCarthy, who would be a franchise-altering player if he hits. And Dallas Turner could be an extremely high-impact player as well um, if all of the reports from camp and, and kind of what we saw in limited action in those preseasons are good. Right? So I went a little bit more into kind of overall draft philosophy and what I was expecting there, but I don't think that Scene and Booth being failures means that Quasi Adolfo Mensa is a terrible GM. Um, you know, considering that it was his first draft, but we do need to hit on the future drafts and, and probably especially this 2024 draft. We need to get big hits out of both Dallas Turner and JJ McCarthy for this to become a successful tenure for Quasi, right? So it, it's kind of a, 
um, it, it's kind of a, a mixture there, right? Where obviously having seen a booth to start out, and I'm, I'm repeating myself here, was a, was a bad start. We need to make up for that bad start. Um, so next, let's move on to a couple other young players. I, I talked about the young defensive linemen, but a couple other young players that impressed me were Dwight McLaughlin and Tristan Jackson, right? So McLaughlin, I... You know, I, I'm not going to say, like, he's a starting caliber player. He's somebody I, I would want to see on the field right away. But I thought he was sticking in coverage. I thought, you know, he had an interception that was kind of gifted to him. But um, I thought he had showed good ball skills throughout the course of the preseason. And I thought that, you know, he was a promising enough young player that he absolutely should have been rostered by the Vikings. And they did keep him on their 53-man roster. Um, the player I was maybe most impressed by outside of uh, Taki Taimani, who I, I think probably had the best preseason of anybody, I would say the second best preseason for me was Tristan Jackson. Um, Jackson really showed a lot for me on the field, especially in that first game with his route running, right? He and J.J. McCarthy seemed to have a really good connection, but I thought he had really upgraded his route running to be a detailed player. You can see him take jab steps and make little fakes to influence the cornerback to get open, whether that was on deeper out routes, there was a slant route that was really good, and then he had, he had great hands, right, making a couple contested catches and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not going to say it was perfect. I thought maybe he put a little bit too much sauce on a couple routes. Like, uh, you'll hear people disparage, you know, a, like Instagram route running or a bowl game route running where at the senior bowl and stuff, guys will take – you know, seven steps before they break and try to make a move and it gets the corner way out of position and it'll create a lot of open space for them. But the timing of the throw is completely thrown off by the time you do that in a real football game, right? Um, I thought there were a couple of plays where Jackson kind of suffered from that, but in general, I thought he was pretty smooth coming in and out of breaks and was really impressed with his ability to tell a story with his route running and manipulate defenders. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up on him, because, you know, obviously it's been cast as a negative for him, I think, was the J.J. McCarthy interception that we saw. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Jackson kind of drifted a few yards down the field in that route. Uh, Brett Coleman, who has, I, he does the bootleg football podcast, but he also has his own YouTube channel, talked a little bit about that and said, and I agree with him, in some cases, the wide receiver and the corner quarterback if they're on the same page have the wide receiver drift in that case if they're going against an aggressive corner and jack jones is an aggressive corner who knows that they're trying to jump the route and you can actually get a a bigger play with yards after the catch in that situation um if you drift on a little bit so McCarthy didn't get the ball there. You know, obviously they either weren't on the same page or McCarthy didn't get enough on his throw to be able to get it to him. Um, but, you know, that's that's a communication preseason error. I don't think it was necessarily a uh, terrible mistake by Trishan Jackson or, or something that will really come back to bite him in the future. So I, I was really impressed by him. Um, and both of those guys made the roster. I thought I thought Jackson clearly earned his roster spot, right? Um, so if we jump over to the practice squad, I, I think three of the younger players that I was really impressed by were Dallas Gant, first and foremost. I thought he had a great trigger in the run game. Like he was seeing things really well. He was hitting the holes in the proper space with the proper timing. He had some really nice coverage plays. I mean, I think he tipped like three or four passes throughout the course of the preseason, including the Lewis scene interception in the Browns game. Um, so really just, just, Great work from him overall. In coverage, I thought maybe he was a little bit slow and a little bit behind. Like, if you look at the tipped passes, it's kind of not great throws by the quarterback. Like, if they throw to the advantage that the receiver have, it might turn into a completion. So I think there's probably a little bit more for him to learn there. But I think he made the best out of the opportunities that he did have and the best out of the situations he was in. So I was excited to see him make the practice squad. Um, those coverage questions mean that I'm not exactly sure that he would have been ready to be on a 53-man roster and play you know, in regular season games. But I was encouraged by the beginnings of what I saw. The other player I liked who really flashed for me rather than being consistent, right? Like a lot of people, I think, were kind of expecting Bo Richter to make the roster. 
And I didn't think he he really had played roster worthy, but he showed a lot, and honestly, a lot more than Andre Carter, right? Who I kind of thought in a similar mold um, because they were both service academy guys. Um, but you know, his ability to win, honestly, just his ability to win. Like Andre Carter, I never really saw the athleticism last year or the ability to win against tackles. Um, you know, he won with speed. He had a little bit of power to him, much more than, than I thought Andre Carter did. So that was exciting. I, I'm hopeful that with another year of development in the NFL program, rather than having to kind of fluctuate back and forth between the military requirements that you have and then the football requirements that you have that, that really make it difficult on the service academy athletes, um, hopefully with a, a year of NFL development, I, Richter can improve. Uh, to, to become, you know, a player who can make a roster in the NFL. Uh, the third player I thought was was really good during the preseason. Again, maybe not somebody I would have rostered either. Like, I didn't include him on my 53-man roster or anything. Uh, was Tyrese Robinson, who was a guard. Um, I, I thought he definitely outplayed Michael Jurgens, but obviously Jurgens has the draft capital, so, so I kind of went through that and why that makes sense to me that the Vikings kept Jurgens. Um, but Robinson, I, I thought the power was really impressive. Um, he's a big guy, and I thought he was really, really good at moving people in the run game. I really didn't see any pass protection mishaps from him. There, there probably were one or two that I'm not just remembering offhand right now. But you know, I, I think his size and his physicality were, were what really impressed me from him. So I'm hopeful that you know, a, as we move along, maybe throughout the course of the season, he can get. A little, like, I think the Vikings' offense is set as it is, right? And the offensive line is set as it is. Like, I wouldn't want to change out any of the five starters that they have in terms of Darasaw, Brandell, Bradbury, uh, Ingram, and O'Neal. And obviously, I don't want any of those guys to get injured. But I think he is somebody who could step up and play a little bit if that were to happen um, as a practice squad elevation or something. But I'm excited to hopefully give him another year to develop and see what he can be in next season's preseason. Um, so that was, you know, probably quite a bit of information on some of the lower end of the roster guys. I wanted to flip it over now and go into kind of more of the high level, like who we have, who, who we're actually going to see on the field when it comes to Sunday against the New York Giants, right? Um, because I, I think preseason was awesome. Uh, first of all, getting three wins was great. By the way, I went to the Eagles game live. I was, I was kind of right outside the tunnel there. So that was a lot of fun to go to live and just see. Uh, I was right outside the tunnel where the Vikings went in and out. So like you could see the energy that Levi Drake Rodriguez in particular plays with. Like he's the one who is coming out with his hair on fire, running out of the tunnel for a preseason game, like just yelling at the top of his lungs. Um, it, it was really cool to see that. And the energy that he plays with, I think, is a little bit infectious and probably helped that defensive line become so dominant over the course of the preseason. Um, but, you know, I, it, it was just kind of cool. Got to see Justin Jefferson like 20 feet away from me. You know, just fun stuff to to be a fan there. Uh, not the best angle for watching the game, so I, I had to go back and do the uh, the tape work afterwards. But... Uh, just a fun experience and fun to see some of the guys and uh, how they uh, interacted there. Um, so let's flip it over to the the positional thoughts, right? Like the actual starters on this team. I, I've talked a lot about backups or, or guys that aren't even on the team at this point. Um, so we'll go position by position, starting with offense first, starting with obviously the most important position first, the quarterback position. Um you know, one of the last episodes we did was a breakdown of J.J. McCarthy's tape at Michigan. Uh, Nick and I went through and kind of did the full scouting report. Obviously, unfortunately, J.J. McCarthy has the uh, – this is old news. If you're getting this from me, I, I, I can't even believe that. But the meniscus terror that will keep him out the whole season. My biggest concern with that is I would have loved for J.J. McCarthy to sit 17 games this season. I think that may have been the best reality for his long-term development or sit 16 games and play in the final, you know, regular season game to kind of get a taste of active NFL football, but there's not really pressure on him, right? It's just you can kind of go out and ball out, try to learn what he can can and can't do on an actual NFL regular season game as opposed to just doing it in a preseason game, right? He was very impressive 
in my opinion, his first preseason game. Like, you saw the arm talent and the physical talent that he has, and that's something that Nick and I tried to hammer home with J.J. McCarthy, I think, is that this dude is not just, like, your average game manager quarterback, which is kind of what, in my opinion, he was cast as by a lot of people coming out of Michigan, right? Because Michigan was so dominant running the football and they had such a dominant defense, they didn't ask him to do a lot. But... In situations where he was asked to do things, you could see he had all the physical physical ability in the world to go ahead and do it. So that's why it was like, you know, people were gushing over Drake May as a physical marvel or, you know, Kayla Williams' tools. And I, I think Kayla Williams is in a little bit different category because of his ability as a thrower. But I didn't think J.J. McCarthy was all that far off from J- Drake May in terms of his ability to use his legs to extend plays, his ability to manage a pocket, and his ability to throw the ball you know, into whatever window that he needed to. Like, I I thought he had all of those physical tools kind of that May did. So it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition between the two to me there. But obviously very disappointing that he's not going to be able to play for the Vikings at all this year. He is on season and ending IR, which means he can't play in any of the 17 games or couldn't come back for the playoffs if the Vikings were to make the playoffs. Um, so that leaves uh, Sam Darnold to be the starter all season uh, with Nick Mullins as, as the backup. And they cut Jaron Hall after he initially stayed on the 53-man roster for Brett Ribbon, um, who's kind of been a journeyman quarterback, right? So you have really journeyman Sam Darnold, former number three overall pick. You have veteran backup Nick Mullins, and you have veteran backup journeyman Brett Ribbon for the 2024 season. Right, not particularly exciting unless you want to get excited about Sam Darnold, which I, I want to talk about a little bit here. First of all, I think Sam Darnold was phenomenal in the one drive we saw him in the preseason. Um, he hit a number of throws that were great anticipation. Absolutely, you can see the arm talent on display with the throws, right? Everything we know about Sam Darnold in terms of the physical specimen, I, I think, is still there, right? Like, he's going to be a guy who can extend plays a little bit, uh, kind of in the same physical talent mold as J.J. McCarthy, right? Like, he can move with his legs. He can escape the pocket. He can do that sort of thing, although we didn't really see that in the preseason game all that much. But uh, he also has has a great arm, right? He can hit any throw on the field, which should, for the most part, be a prerequisite for a quarterback. But... But Darnold certainly has an above average arm, I would say, for for overall NFL quarterbacks, right? Like Nick Mullins, his problem is that he really can't put the ball where he wants to all the time, right? I, I think that's Nick Mullins' great downfall as a quarterback. Sam Darnold can put the ball where he wants to. So that's a great start for him. Um, and then the timing he played with in that first game on that first ride was really impressive. Uh, there were three throws. One was, I believe, a corner route on a smash concept. It was kind of wide open, but he hit it right on the money. The other was a dagger route, so a dig coming in. And that was a beautiful anticipation throw where he layered it over the linebacker. And then the third one was also impressive. Like, Ty Chandler tripped him in pass protection. Ty Chandler was in pass protection. His feet got cut up with Sam Darnold. So it was an out route. Sam Darnold throws it with anticipation while he's falling down, and it's right on the money to convert, I believe, a third down. At least it, it was a, it became a first down. I don't remember if it was third down or not, right? So we see that from Darnold. I, I think there's a lot of hope that he can be a, you know, a, approach up to an average NFL quarterback. I will say I don't know what's going to happen when things go wrong, right? Sam Darnold on script in that game was good. Sam Darnold off script, we haven't really seen much of that, right? And that was always the problem with Sam is you'd get the all these boneheaded mistakes, right? We have, you know, everybody remembers the seeing ghosts game, right? And I don't want to belabor on that, but that's, you know, he doesn't have the easy option. So he goes ahead and makes a terrible play. Um, I'm a little bit concerned if things go poorly for him this year, that that can stack, right? But hopefully the infrastructure the Vikings have will, first of all, keep him on schedule most of the time. I think that should obviously be the goal for anybody. But second of all, get him to the place where he can, um, you know, kind of be more comfortable either taking checkdowns or throwing the ball away 
or preventing himself from making boneheaded mistakes when he needs to extend the play, and then still have some of that creation ability, right? We don't want to completely take away the creative gene from Sam Darnold, but I think we need to temper it down more so than you would want to for like a Patrick Mahomes or something, right? Because he has the, because Darnold has the tendency to make bad plays when he tries to get creative. So I, I think we want to temper that down a little bit, right? Um, so it'll be interesting for quarterback. Obviously, really excited about J.J. McCarthy moving forward. Really disappointed about his injury, but there's nothing we can do about it at this point. So we'll, we'll kind of see how it goes for the Vikings right now. Um, so if we jump on to the running back position, you know, probably the most interesting roster decision the Vikings made on cutdown day was only keeping two running backs, right? They kept just Aaron Jones and... Ty Chandler on the roster. They have Miles Gaskin, who they cut but brought back to the practice squad. They also brought back Dwayne McBride, but then they later cut him from an out for an outside running back um, from who was originally with the Colts, I think. Um, but I, I, you know, it, it is certainly interesting that the Vikings only kept two running backs on the roster. I, I think there's a couple things to it. One, the third down got a like half must pass passing situations, I think, are going to primarily go to C.J. Ham. So they did this somewhat often last season where C.J. Ham was in as the pass protector in situations where they knew they were going to pass, right? So like third and, and seven plus are pure passing plays. They're plays where you typically, where you often get blitzed by the opponent, right? So you want to have the most sturdy pass protection option you can at running back because you're typically keeping the running back in. And you're really only using the running back as a check down option. Like you're not going to get five receivers out in the route in those situations. So the Vikings have pretty clearly to me signaled their intention to use CJ Ham in those situations there. Um, Obviously, the running backs should get involved in the pass game in, in other ways, right? Like Aaron Jones in particular has always been a great uh, screen player and somebody to use in the passing game throughout his career. I, I think Ty Chandler can do some interesting stuff just with his physical abilities there as well. Um, but even with that being said, you would typically roster three running backs and, and have three running backs play on game day. Um, so I expect Miles Gaskin will be a practice squad call up. I, I think Miles Gaskin was clearly a better all around running back than Kenny Wongu was. So it doesn't kind of shock me that the Vikings stuck with him after they ended up keep, uh, cutting Wongu. I think Wongu, you know, he had a really exciting run on outside zone, uh, where he scored like a 40 or touchdown against the Raiders, but, Really, to me, that play wasn't he did anything interesting other than be fast, right? Like, And, and his speed, obviously, was a huge asset uh, in the kick return game as well. But with the changing kick return rules, you know, uh, we, we've seen a couple games now. There haven't been a whole lot of returns in the first place. And second of all, you know, it reads more like a traditional run play. So the Vikings might actually like Ty Chandler, who I believe they have stated will be their primary kick returner along with Brandon Powell. Um you know, they might like those guys' ability to read the quicker developing, more kind of outside zone run play better than what Wang Wu did because Wang Wu, I thought, really struggled to read plays outside of that one touchdown that he had. And he also really struggled in pass protection. Uh, you know, J.J. McCarthy had a couple, took a couple nasty hits because of his uh, kind of pass protection. Maybe not errors per se, but just inability to block guys who were blitzing. Um, so, you know, with the running back room, I'm – the decision to keep two was interested, interesting, but I'm really excited about what Aaron Jones brings to this team. Um, I, I think he's a really high level runner, especially for the scheme that the Vikings are going to want to run. And I think that really, uh, you know, part of the problem with the offensive line from the previous years was that we lacked a running back who could, you know, find the holes that they did create. I, I don't think that they were great at getting movement. But I, I don't think there were a ton of situations where the running back had absolutely nothing there, right? Like Alex Madison, to me, would get you exactly what the run was blocked for. Um, I, I don't think he really made all that many bad decisions, but also he was unable to break anything beyond the initial contact. And like he could break a couple tackles and stuff, but he just didn't have the burst to be able to turn a okay blocked run into a nice game. Aaron Jones kind of has the ability to read it like Alex Madison does, but then also has the burst to get the yardage that actually turns it into an impressive run play. 
Like, we saw some flashes from Ty Chandler last year of nice running. I, I think he struggled a little bit with reading what was going on in front of him. I think I saw some improvement in the game against the Raiders, which was really the only action we saw from him this preseason. I thought he pretty consistently read the field well and read what was being blocked in front of him well. But I'm still a little bit hesitant to say that he's going to be a high-level you know, player at the running back position. So I'm really excited to see Aaron Jones, who I think gives you the good reads of the blocking scheme, right? He can read the play out well. And also the exciting explosive play that we kind of saw in flashes from Ty Chandler last year. Um, So excited for that. You know, the run blocking needs to be up to snuff, but I I think there was just so much left on the bone um, with Dalvin Cook, who really kind of declined athletically by his final years of Viking. And then by Alex Madison, who kind of never had the athleticism to exploit things last in the last couple of years that that was a big part of why the running game was so bad. So, you know, needs to get better. We'll see how it goes moving forward. Um, we'll flip over to the wide receiver room. I don't need to say much about Justin Jefferson. Like he's the best receiver in the NFL. He's paid that way. He absolutely deserves it. Jordan Addison, I think is a great compliment to Justin Jefferson, right? Um, you know, his speed and vertical element of his game unlock something if you want to try to double cover JJ because, um, you know, it, it, it's just you're leaving him with a one-on-one deep. If you have a quarter scheme and you, or if you if we go back to Donatel, right, quarter, quarter, half, uh, the way to the way they would cover a number one receiver is they would call the cover two side to that receiver's side and basically have the underneath corner uh, press him at the line of scrimmage, get your hands on him at the line of scrimmage and have the cloud corner and have the safety over top as a cloud over top, right? That's kind of how one double principles work in the Brian Flores defense as well. Well, if you put Jefferson to one side in a two by two set and Addison's on the other side and you send those two guys vertical against, uh, you know, a quarter, quarter, half scheme, you're going to get a one on one for Jordan Addison in that scenario. You only really have the corner and the safety who are able to attempt to keep up with Addison deep on that other side. And they're both playing quarters. So in a, in a kind of a two by two formation. So you can exploit deep routes really easily and he wins really well deep. So I, I think that's great. And then once we have TJ Hawkinson back, like as a check down underneath option, you can also stretch the seam from the tight end position. It really is one of the top trio of pass catchers in the NFL. In my opinion, it might be the single top trio of pass catchers in the NFL um, in terms of two receivers and a tight end that the Vikings have. Um, now, the rest of the depth of wide receiver is kind of interesting, right? I liked what I saw from Brandon Powell last year, but I think he's more of an underneath kind of yak, kind of third and short option, right? You want him running mesh and getting a runaway and kind of making something happen. And he can make some tough catches underneath only like curl routes and stuff. Like, I, I was pretty happy with that. But I don't think he's necessarily a guy who runs a vertical threatening route tree deep for early downs or, like, play action or, or something you kind of want um, to to get when you're trying to throw the ball down the field, right? And that's what Jalen Naylor is for. Now, obviously, uh, recently, both uh, Jordan Addison and Jalen Naylor were on the injury report with an ankle injury. It sounds like I'm recording this Saturday afternoon. It sounds like they're good to go for the Giants game. So, you know, historically, injuries have been what has held Naylor back. Obviously he was injured for a significant chunk of last season and really didn't get a lot of run after a promising like couple games at the end of his rookie season. But if he can stay healthy, I think he showed in the uh, preseason that he really can become a problem in the vertical passing game, right? Like winning on the corner routes or winning on that deep dig that I talked about uh, with the Sam Darnold throws. Um, I also think that Tristan Jackson is kind of in a similar mode. Like Naylor might be a little bit faster. I, I don't know I, I exactly what the time speed for Jackson is, but I think Jackson wins very well in the vertical portion of the field. And he's a little bit of a bigger body, right? He had the touchdown against the Eagles where he kind of made a contested catch through contact in his back. He had another slant catch on the fourth and one uh, that uh, J.J. McCarthy converted, I think that was right before the Trent Sherfield touchdown in the Raiders game. 
Um, so his size, I think, and and he's not huge. I think he's still like six one or something. But it, but he plays a little bit bigger than like a Jordan Addison or or a Jalen Naylor does. I think, and, and certainly the Brandon Powell who's like five nine. So I, I think that might be able to add an element as a rotational as kind of a, a red zone kind of target there. So I, I do kind of like the Vikings group behind their top two players you know none of them are, are flashy high level players that if you ask somebody who is in you know nfl media let's say ray who covers the league would really think would have a strong impact on the team and, and that's fair right none of them have really produced at a high level at the nfl but i think there are you know there's some depth there and then i also like trent Sherfield, you know who i probably should have mentioned in here i, I don't think he's necessarily going to be a force in the passing game, but I loved his run blocking ability and his tenacity in the, in the run game, right? Which is a nice rotational piece. And I, I think he's got, you know, he had a couple drops during the preseason. I, I don't know if that's those drops are a true measure of his hands. Like he might be with Powell kind of a third and short option or a, a short game option to where you can block with him, you can put him tight up against the line of scrimmage, and he can also kind of find a little bit of space in the zone defense and catch a pass, right? So it kind of gives you the run, the ability to run the ball in short yarded situations with him on the field, rather than asking somebody like Naylor or, you know, somebody like Justin Jefferson, who is actually was, was a really good blocker at LSU, but he's not the type of person that you should be asking to block just because uh, he's such a good receiver that, you know, you, you don't want him to like get hurt getting rolled up on in a pile or something like that. Um, and Jordan Addison, obviously from a size perspective, isn't somebody you can ask to block really all that, all that often. Um, so, you know, wide receiver room, I'm, I'm really I was really impressed. I, I was concerned with the depth and I was like, man, I don't even know if I want to roster Tristan Jackson or Jalen Naylor or Trent Sherfield heading into the preseason, but they kind of turned my opinion around with their preseason performance. Um, so I, I'm really happy with how that kind of has turned out over the course of the preseason and, and excited to see who might emerge as that kind of third receiving threat in the wide receiver room during the regular season. I, obviously, Naylor, I think, has the inside track, but we'll kind of wait and see. I think they might be kind of used more situationally than it's somebody is the third receiver on the field all the time. Um, so flipping it over to the tight end room, you know, obviously the first thing is that everybody's waiting for TJ Hawkinson to get back, uh, a report I saw suggested that he might be back week seven, which is the week after the Vikings buy. I think that's a perfectly fine timeline, right? The earliest he can come back is week five, but you don't want to rush him back from a, a very significant knee injury, right? He tore his ACL and MCL on that nasty, nasty hit where it was direct to his kneecap. Um, so, you know, I, he's a phenomenal player to me. He kind of, gives the Vikings so much optionality because of his ability as a blocker and then also as a vertical seam stretching tight end who's a reliable target underneath and can get you kind of those yards after the catch as well, right? So, like, he can kind of do it all in terms of running a tight end route tree, which is not something I think you see from a majority of players in the league. Like a Cole Komet, for example, I think doesn't give you the vertical stretch element that TJ Hawkinson does, which is what makes TJ Hawkinson one of the most valuable players at the position for me. He's not a lockdown blocker, right? Like he's not George Kittle out there blocking or like a, a pure blocking tight end like a Mercedes Lewis or like a Josh Oliver, but that's why the Vikings have Josh Oliver. When we're in 12 personnel, you know, you can really get in there uh, and block in the run game. But I think he's a competent blocker more so than like a Sam Laporta is right for the lions um so i i think that combination of skills is really impressive and it's really valuable to the vikings so i'm hoping he'll get back obviously in the meantime we have uh josh oliver who will primarily be used as a blocker and johnny munt who kevin o'connell just loves so we're probably going to see some rollouts to johnny munt and that sort of thing uh, while we're waiting TJ, for TJ Hawkinson to get back. I also liked what I saw out of Nick Muse during the preseason. Um, I thought he played pretty well, and, and he has some combo ability. I don't know if he'll ever be kind of the vertical threat and the receiving threat that TJ Hawkinson is, but I think he kind of has the ability to be a mid-level kind of all-around tight end 
at his peak. So it's kind of nice to see him stick around. I also wanted to shout out uh, Nikhil Harry, who played, you know, during the preseason. He's on the practice squad. I thought there were a couple of really nice reps from him. Obviously, uh, he does have seam stretching ability, which is kind of exciting. He caught the nice seam ball from Jaron Hall in the Eagles game. And I, I think that, you know, with another year for him to kind of reshape his body, I'm excited to see what it looks like next offseason. I don't think he was ready yet with the position switch from wide receiver to tight end. But I think as he develops into that, he might become more of an interesting option there moving forward. Um, so the next uh, thing to talk about is the offensive line. Obviously, Christian Derrissaw and Brian O'Neill have the tackle spots locked down. Uh, we haven't talked about it on this show, but Christian Derrissaw got paid a very nice contract, uh, $26 million a year, which came in at the time second behind Penny Sewell. Um, I believe in terms of cash flow, it's definitely been passed by the recent Trent Williams extension. It was passed by Tristan Wirfs as well. But if you look at both the Penn Sewell, the Tristan Wirfs deal, and then the Derrissaw deal, like, I think Derrissaw was, was very in line. There, were, there was a little bit of discussion in the Viking spaces, like, oh, did the Vikings underpay Derrissaw? Is this going to become, like, another deal Hunter situation where they really need to pay him? But I don't think so. I, I, I kind of think that conversation missed what the overall tackle market was, right? Because you have... Penny Sewell slot in at $28 million a year, right? Penny Sewell is a much more accomplished player than what Christian Derrissaw has been to this point in his career. He's made all pros. He's made pro bowls. Derrissaw doesn't have those accolades. And I think Derrissaw is a really, really good player, but I don't think he's quite up to the level of Penny Sewell. And I don't think he's quite up to the level of Tristan Wirfs, right? Like you have the very elite tackles, and that is the Trent Williamses, the Tristan Wirfs, the Penny Sewells of the world, the Laramie Tunsils of the world. And I think Derrissaw is a little half step below them to just a, like a, like an excellent tackle, right? Like he's kind of on the Rashawn Slater level to me, which is just a, a tiny little half step below that. Um, so I think that if you look at the contract, you know, it's, it's a year early contract. I was able to project it within like a million dollars because I just looked at the Sewell contract. I looked at the Andrew Thomas contract, who I think is, is very comparable to Christian Derrissaw. Um, Thomas hasn't made a pro bowl. He hasn't made the all pro. So he doesn't have the league wide recognition that some of these other guys do, do, even if he is a very, very good player in his own right. Um, so that, that's kind of where I thought Derrissaw slotted in. And I think we kind of thought Tristan Wirfs would completely reset the market and blow it out of the water and get like $30 million a year. And that's what would look, make Derrissaw kind of look bad. But he really only got just barely more than what Penny Sewell did. So I, I really think Derrissaw's $26 million is in line with what the rest of the tackle market looked like. Um, Brian O'Neill, I don't need to say much on. Like, I, I think they're both excellent players. I, I think they're both great blindside protectors. Uh, or Derrissaw's blindside protector, obviously. Uh, I think they're just great offensive tackles who are kind of cornerstones for this team, right? And then there are more questions along the interior offensive line. Obviously, Blake Brandell has uh, solidified as the starter at left guard. Uh, you have Bradbury and Ingram at center and right guard, right? Um, you know, I... I listen to a lot of national stuff, right? Uh, I like Mina Kimes' show. I like the athletic football show. And I like what Nate Tice does as well. So he moved over to Yahoo. He's, he's got a podcast with um, Charles McDonald and Matt Harmon. And I, I really like both of those guys as well. So that's kind of the national stuff that I'm listening to. And, you know, I, I think especially if you listen to the athletic preview of the NFC North, they have major questions about the Vikings interior offensive line. And I think that's fair, right? I mean, we're starting Blake Brandell, who I believe was an undrafted free agent who really hasn't played all that much. Like he played in spot duty last year at left guard, kind of the unquestioned starter at left guard, even though we brought Dalton Risner back because Risner has been injured. We have Garrett Bradbury who historically has not been very good at center. And then we have Ed Ingram who historically has not been very good at right guard. Um, you know, so one of the things we need is improvement from Ingram at right guard, right? And that's hopefully natural progression as he becomes a third year player. Um, one of the things that Luke Braun on Lockdown Vikings has talked about is we have, uh, you know, the move to Blake Brandell was kind of to beef up the left guard position a little bit, break 
Blake Brandell was a tackle in college. He's really tackle size. He's a little bit tall. He's a little bit heavier, I think, than what Dalton Risner is. So the hope with Brandell for me is you can get dual protections on a guy like Dexter Lawrence, who I'm going to talk about in a little while, and try to protect Bradbury, who struggles against power, obviously has historically struggled against power. Um, so the hope is you're protecting him a little bit, right? From a backup perspective, I feel really good about David Questenberry as our swing tackle. Um, Walter Rouse, I don't think necessarily is ready to play, but he is on the roster. I, I feel much more comfortable about him playing than I do about Michael Jurgens. And then on the interior, you have Dan Feeney, who I liked coming out as a prospect, but really hasn't done much, kind of bounced around. Um, I, I believe he was coming out in the Pat Elflin year. Um, so... You know, I, I do think there are pretty strong interior questions for the Vikings, but I think that the tackles are good enough that you can keep the interior three to themselves, right? And if those guys can hold up in pass protection, I think they'll be, I, I think it'll be fine. I think there's a little bit of an open question, but they did a lot, they've done a lot better job modifying their pass protection calls to protect that interior a little bit more. Um, over the past couple of years, and it's resulted in a reduced amount of pressure, right, under Chris Cooper as opposed to under the previous regime. So I'm hopeful that that can continue, and we see growth from a Blake Brandell if he can turn into a solid starter, and an Ed Ingram if he can turn into a solid starter from being one of the worst guards in the league his rookie year, right? So there are certainly still questions there, um, but I think... Honestly, like, we'll just kind of have to wait and see in the past game. Like, I, I think they were fine enough in the past game, the past couple of years, and then the run game was really where you see the concern. I'm hoping that Aaron Jones kind of eliminates those concerns in the run game, right? Because I think it was more running back dri- driven than it was offensive line driven. Um, so if we flip it over to the defensive side of the ball, you know, on the defensive line, I expect the starters to be Harrison Phillips and Jonathan Bullard. I th- feel great about those guys in run defense. You know, the Vikings run a five down front with the two edge rushers. So it'll be Jerry Tillery, probably rotationally. He's kind of taken the, the Dean Lowry role, let's call it, right? And I'm hope, I'm, I hope that Jerry Tillery isn't as bad as Dean Lowry was last year, but I'm a little bit concerned that Jerry Tillery might be as bad as Dean Lowry was last year. So we'll kind of have to see how that develops over the course of the season. Um, You know, I I talked about the guys at the top. I would love to see a guy like Jalen Redmond be able to take over Jerry Tillery's role and actually become a productive player. Um, I don't know. That's not something I would count on, right? He's making a huge jump in competition from the UFL to the NFL, right? There, there's a huge jump in competition from the UFL to NFL preseason. And then there's another huge, there's probably a much larger jump from the NFL preseason to the actual NFL where you're going against real offensive linemen. So I, I'd love to see him kind of as a rotational player there. But I'm not sure. Um, Levi Drake Rodriguez, kind of a similar thing. I'd love to see him jump from Texas A&M Commerce to be a contributing player in his first year in the NFL. I'm just not going to try to have to put that. I don't want to have to put that on his shoulders, right, in year one. So um, I would kind of try to put Jalen Redmond over Levi Drake Rodriguez at first. But, like, the energy and the strength that Levi Drake Rodriguez plays with is really impressive. And I think there's some little technique stuff um, like on the one stun against the Browns I posted this to Twitter where he really uh, showed uh, a good awareness of being able to grab the uh, offensive lineman's chest plate and pull him out of the way to spring the looping player who I think was Andre Carter on that play and kind of get him there um, so I, I think there was some really promising stuff from Levi Drake Rodriguez in the preseason. I'm not sure it's going to be something that we're going to be able to say is a, hey, week one in the NFL, like we're going to need you to play significant snaps. So I'm hoping it can kind of build up over the course of the year. Um, so, yeah, I, obviously questions about what we're going to be able to do on that defensive line to get pass rush, right? Like, you're not going to get it from Jonathan Bullard or Harrison Phillips. It's just not their bag. They're great in run defense. They're a valuable component of the Vikings defensive line, but we need to find pass rush somewhere else. Um, That pass rush may come from the edge rusher group, right? We may just say on any obvious passing downs, okay, we're going to have one defensive tackle if it's Jerry Tillery or if it's uh, maybe even Redmond or Levi Drake Rodriguez or, you know, Bullard or Phillips. And then we're going to just put a ton of edge rushers in there. We're going to we're going to load up the box with 
all four maybe of Patrick Jones, um, Andrew Van Ginkle, Dallas Turner, and Jonathan Grenard. Obviously, I went kind of in reverse order of importance there for those guys. Um, I, I love the depth that the Vikings have here. I think that keeping Jihad Ward was nice because it gives you a guy with interior versatility. Um, you had Patrick Jones played a little bit kind of interior on those, let's call them NASCAR packages, right, where you have a, a traditional edge rusher aligned inside at three technique. Jihad Ward has massive size. Um, I think he'll be able to help in run defense in that regard with his size as well if you need a kind of a rotational package where you're really trying to stop the run in a particular scenario. Um, so, but I, I mean, let's talk about the top build guys, right? Jonathan Grenard, I think, is a great candidate for this defense because of the power and the aggressiveness that he plays with, right? He's going to be a great crasher on stunts, but he's also going to be a great looper on stunts. Like the physicality he takes to opposing offensive tackles, I think, is something that will really benefit him. Obviously, he, I like, I don't think he's to the level of Daniil Hunter, so that's still a loss there, but I think you add him and combine him with the other pieces, right? Dallas Turner has been a phenomenal speed rusher uh, throughout the course of the preseason, and the bend that he showed really honest, seemed almost a little bit better than what I saw in college. If you want to read my scouting report on Dallas Turner or any of the other rookies, I, I did post that over at Zone Coverage. I meant to kind of talk about that at the top. I, I know we had said after doing J.J. McCarthy that we wanted to get through scouting reports for other players it, it didn't happen but you can read my detailed thoughts on all of them over at zone coverage um so but getting back into it dallas turner you know a phenomenal uh speed off the edge i think he kind of has an inside counter that he can win with so i think he's ready to play in the nfl right away um he's got great length uh he's got Great physicality, especially for his size, for his weight, right? He's a little bit undersized compared to what you would want ideally maybe for an edge rusher, but I think that helps with his athleticism at the position. So it's kind of a nice combo. Obviously, Andrew Van Ginkle, I think, is a sturdy run defense player despite his size and played really well as a pass rusher last year. Um, so as a rotational piece who's kind of a do-everything guy, like I think – you know, you you almost want Dallas Turner splitting his time, right? Become between becoming a, a Jonathan Grenard pass rush, like true edge rusher type, but also having the athleticism to do a couple of the things that Andrew Van Ginkle does. So I, I'm really excited to see how that group uh, turns out, especially on like third and long, where we get to unleash them against opposing offensive lines. Um, one last thing I wanted to touch because I mentioned him earlier, Andre Carter had some pretty impressive flashes this preseason. And I thought that last season, honestly, it was very bad, right? But for me, the cliche is, could be, he came in a year away from being a year away, right? And I think we saw enough improvement and it wasn't all good. Let me, let me be real. But like, I didn't see anything from this guy all last season. Like I wasn't seeing pass rush wins pretty much ever from him. So I, I think the fact that he was able to get around the edge and get after the quarterback and we could see the athleticism in those flashes on tape was something that was kind of interesting to me. Um, so he stuck around on the Vikings practice squad. You know, if last year was a year away from being a year away, this year he was definitely still a year away. So we'll kind of see if he's able to develop as, as still a little bit of a pet project. I kind of just wanted to shout that out, though. Um, so if we move on to the linebacker room, and I might try to pick it up here a little bit because I've hit an hour. Uh, I, I think the first thing you see is that the linebacker depth is not great. Kamu Grugia Hill has kind of been an NFL journeyman, so I might be okay with him seeing the field, but he's been primarily a special teams player throughout his career. Uh, Brian Asamoah, I think, really hasn't shown enough on the field to be considered somebody I would want to thrust into a starting role. Um, and, you know, it could be that Ivan Pace's ascension really hurt Brian Asamoah's development, but even still, like I, I'm not sure he's developed to the point where I, I really would want him playing significant snaps if one of our two starting linebackers in Ivan Pace and, and Brian Cashman went down. So, you know, a couple questions on depth there. I think it might be the weakest position after the first two players um, kind of on the roster, but 
Ivan Pace and Blake Cashman, I love the combination. I, I think Ivan Pace is a rocket kind of going after and attacking the run game and opposing offensive linemen, even despite his size and his ability to move sideline to sideline and, and read out plays and work through traffic, I, I think is phenomenal. Blake Cashman, um, you know, I, I kind of, we talked about this like months ago, but I don't think he is maybe as high level of a run defender as what Ivan Pace is, but I think he's really phenomenal in coverage and his, his flexibility and his range in that area, I think should really help the Vikings because they didn't really have a quality coverage player uh, at the linebacker position last year. I think Pace is still a little bit of a question in coverage. Uh, from what I saw in the Raiders game, I, I thought there were a couple of things that I was, I'm not thrilled with it in terms of how he dropped back and covered a couple plays. So I, I would like to see him continue to improve in that area. But uh, overall, I think it's a, it's a pretty nice pairing where you kind of have the thunder and lightning, right? Where, where pace brings the boom and uh, Cashman is kind of able to cloud it over top. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a good combination. And I think Cashman's, coverage ability is really going to level up what Brian Flores is able to do on the back end with some of these blitz coverages. Um, the next thing is the cornerback room, which I think has the most long-term questions on the team, right? Like short-term, we're pretty solid. I, I think Stefan Gilmore was the only corner out there in free agency, and that includes Adoree Jackson, who we'll be seeing because the Giants re-signed him, um, who I would have wanted to roster really at the time that the Vikings signed him. Um, and then they also appear to have Shaq Griffin back from injury. So it'll be Gilmore along with Murphy, I think, in two cornerback sets. And then if they run with three cornerback sets, which really would be a dime package, I think, because we'll see a massive snap participation for Josh Metellus and Cam Bynum and Harrison Smith and maybe even Theo Jackson, right? So the Vikings last year had three safeties on the field for the majority of the snaps, right? So your nickel package really for the Vikings was a big nickel where they had two corners and three safeties. And that was what they ran most of the time on defense. Um, so that'll be Stephon Gilmore and Byron Murphy, right? And I love Byron Murphy. I, I He kind of got dunked on a couple times in the Raiders game. You know, it happened a couple times last year, but I think he's really good at staying in position um, with – receivers like he he's just a, a sticky coverage guy and you know I I'm hopeful that that will continue after the injury the defense really fell apart after he got hurt uh Stephon Gilmore I think might signal more man coverage for the Vikings this year which is something I think Byron Murphy can do pretty easily right Stephon Gilmore has been a man coverage corner throughout his career the the Cowboys last year ran a ton of cover one or they mixed it up cover one and zone but like they are primarily a they were kind of primarily a single high team where he's kind of left out isolated on the edge. And I think he held up pretty well last year. Like he's a, he's a very smart veteran player. And I think he's still a very quality corner who kind of gives you optionality where last year, the Vikings didn't really have anybody outside of Byron Murphy who was comfortable putting in man coverage. And that's kind of evidenced by the fact that a Caleb Evans is like the fifth string corner, right? He's five out of six on the depth chart and sixth is undrafted free agent Dwight McLaughlin, right? Um, they also brought in and kept Fabian Moreau. I don't really have too many strong opinions on Moreau, but he's he's kind of more of a depth rotational piece at this point. So it was kind of an overhaul of an older defensive cornerback room to hopefully solidify behind, you know, obviously Makai Blackman unfortunately got hurt as well, but hopefully give the Vikings kind of the experience to play, I, I think, a little bit more man coverage without getting beat in bad scenarios and also have the flexibility to play Brian Flores' crazy zones because obviously, you know, Shaq Griffin has been in the building at least and Stephon Gilmore has worked with Coach Flores before. So, you know, I, I would say moving forward beyond 2024, Corner is still an absolutely massive need for the Vikings, right? We're relying on a mid 30 Stephon Gilmore. Byron Murphy's contract is up after this year. Like, I, I, I'm pretty sure almost everybody is in the final year of their contract outside of potentially Makai Blackman, right? So that's something that we'll need to look forward to at the end of the season. But for right now, I think they're actually in a pretty good place and a better place than they were last year to be able to cover opposing teams. Um, that flips over to, to safety right where I, I think it's incredible. Um, Harrison Smith is still playing at a strong level, right? I won't say a high level. Like, I don't think he's the elite 
all pro should be hall of famer Harrison Smith that he has been throughout his career, but his veteran experience his ability to disguise things on defense that relies heavily on pre-snap disguise, I think is pretty invaluable and his physicality and his ability to play in the box is something that's still, you know, he can do very well for this team. Cam Bynum is more of the high, like single high safety or, or half field safety who's coming down. He flew down, uh, all last season made a ton of plays. I was really impressed with him. It's kind of an interesting question for me with Bynum, right? Because he's also eligible for an extension this year. This will be the last year of his contract. And I would like to extend Cam Bynum, but I think the Vikings have a little bit of an interesting question at the position because they have so much depth there, right? Um, obviously, Smith is probably going to retire, but they still have Josh Metellus and they still have Theo Jackson behind him, who the coaching staff is very high on. Theo Jackson played, you know, over 100 snaps last year, which is pretty insane if you think about it for, for a safety who's the fourth safety on the team to get 100 snaps on a, in a scenario where every the top three safeties played 90 plus snaps. Well, he was the Vikings ran a very unique defense last year. It's it, they had more snaps from the safety room by far than anybody else in the NFL and that includes Theo Jackson a little bit, right? So maybe the team wants to transition Theo Jackson in to give Harrison Smith some rest, but they might also be looking at it long term and saying, okay, we have depth that we feel really good about at the safety position. So we're going to choose to not extend Cam Bynum right now, who we think is a very good player. I hope it doesn't come back to bite them, right? Like I would like to see Cam Bynum continue to be a part of this football team. I don't really want, want him to, to hit free agency next year, but we'll, we'll kind of have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of gush about the depth, right? I, I think Josh Metellus kind of replaces your need to have a nickel corner on a consistent basis. Um, you know, so you can play Byron Murphy outside uh, on most downs, but then when you want to go to dime, when you're expecting heavy pass, you can move Byron Murphy in the slot and bring Shaq Griffin onto the field, right? But you still, on your base defense, you'll have Byron Murphy outside, you'll have... Um, sorry, it, 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 Stefan Gilmore. I'm getting my uh, the SG on the on the names for the two primary corners. Besides Murphy, is throwing me through a loop there. But Stefan Gilmore, By- Byron Murphy, and then you'll have your two safeties in Harrison Smith and uh, Cam Bynum, and Josh Metellus plays the slot, do it everything player, right? So I think that's going to be your basic defense, um, along with Harrison Phillips. Um, Jonathan Bullard, two edge rushers out of the three in terms of Van Ginkle, Dallas Turner, and uh, Jonathan Grenard, and then two linebackers, Cashman and Pace. Uh, you'll, in some situations, add the third defensive lineman in there. In some situations, you'll pull one of the linebackers off the field. You know, it's it's all kind of up in the air in terms of depending on what your opponent packages does, but that's kind of what the overall defense is going to look like for the season. So let's jump here into the game with the Giants. And like I said, you know, kind of on the defense section, I've been going pretty long here, but I wanted to give you guys as much information as possible. You know, it's been a long time since we've done one of these, so just wanted to get as much out there. Uh, So hopefully you're enjoying so far. If we go into the Giants game, right, it's a rematch of the 2022 playoff game. I kind of put that rematch in quotes. Uh, obviously kind of a sliding doors moment for both teams, right? Ed Donatel gets fired for the Vikings in that scenario. It allows us to bring in, um, Brian Flores on defense. And then it also probably contributes to the Vikings not extending Kirk Cousins, right? If the Vikings are able to win that game against the Giants, maybe they go on and win the next week. And then all of a sudden, You know, they were getting in the NFC Championship game, and the Vikings probably extend Kirk Cousins that offseason, right? If he led them to the NFC Championship game, they get a taste of that. They kind of want to go all in the next year. They chose not to go all in. They chose really to evaluate the roster, I think, in a good way, take a step back, and move on from a number of key veterans, um, or really aging veterans who were were, uh, high snap getters on that team. And, and kind of turn into the youth movement that, that we have today. The Giants, on the other hand, saw what they did from Daniel Jones in that game. 
and decided to give him $40 million a year. And I think that was a laughable decision at the time. And I think it's a, even more laughable now, right? Like, I think everybody thinks that was a terrible contract and terrible decision from Daniel Jones. But they took winning that game as a sign that they could push it further in. Um, so really kind of an interesting sliding doors moment. And now here we are at the beginning of the 2024 season. And neither team has a good outlook, right? Uh, both teams are like six and a half over under on their win totals. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of cellar dwellers. Nobody expects Daniel Jones to be the long-term quarterback for the Giants. Nobody expects Sam Darnold to be the long-term quarterback for the Vikings. Obviously, the Vikings have J.J. McCarthy waiting in the wings. But let's say the Giants decide to franchise, lose that game and decide to franchise tag Daniel Jones uh, and they want to extend Saquon Barkley or whatever because they, they should have really franchise tagged Daniel Jones but they weren't able to come to an agreement with Saquon Barkley, so they wanted to keep him instead, right? Um, but maybe they franchise take Daniel Jones. It's clear that he's not the guy. And then in this draft, they have to draft a quarterback, right? Because there weren't really any good options on the open market. I guess they maybe could have signed Kirk Cousins. But, um, you know, it, they go into this draft with the number five overall pick are looking at it, and maybe they take J.J. McCarthy, right? And the Vikings don't have J.J. McCarthy. So it's a really interesting... Butterfly effects could have happened if that game had changed. Um, just kind of, it's just kind of fun to go back and see because I really don't think, and I wrote an article about this from for uh, zone coverage as well. I I asked Luke on his podcast, Locked On Vikings, if he thought the Giants have done anything better than the Vikings since that 2022 playoff game. And honestly, looking at it, like it's really hard to name something that they've done better. Um, you know, they, they went and they traded for, uh, Brian Burns, which I think was a quality move from him. They didn't give up a ton. They made it, they made a nice Leonard Williams trade where they got a second round pick back from Leonard Williams, who I guess they decided they weren't going to pay. Um, you know, and they are obviously have Dexter Lawrence. So it's like, they've, they've done some okay things, but really I don't think they've done much to, to write home about in the past couple off seasons. So. You know, kind of interesting how that one game might have impacted the Giants' outlook overall and their current outlook. But if we go into the game itself, um, you know, for the Vikings on offense, I think there are a few keys. Uh, one is kind of interesting that the Giants have a new defense coordinator after having Wink Martindale for a couple of years. It's Shane Bowen. He came from the Titans under Mike Rabel. Um, he really is kind of a Belichick tree guy. But it's a it's more traditional on the Belichick tree than Brian Flores is, right? Obviously, Brian Flores is kind of out in wacky land doing a bunch of stuff that nobody else in the NFL does. Uh, super high blitz rates, super aggressive defense, super weird combinations on the back end in terms of coverage. I would say Shane Bowen takes more from the Saban-esque side of the Belichick tree, right? He was under Romeo Cornell uh, when he first... When he first got started in the NFL as uh, a member of the Houston Texans, and then he he worked with Vrabel, right? Um, so on early downs in in run game, he will have odd fronts where three down defensive linemen and two edge rushers, just kind of like the the Vikings do on Bri under Brian Flores in those scenarios, but. Often he's playing either cover three or match quarters behind it, kind of in the Saban tree aspect. And if you, uh, I, this would be a long time ago, but if you want to learn more about how kind of those coverages work, you can go back to our episodes on Brian Flores and kind of how his defense works. I also have articles kind of that I wrote about how that defense works, but essentially it's a, it's a pretty complicated back end defense where you're passing off a lot of things. The thing for the Giants is, like, I just don't think they have the defensive talent to cover our wide receivers, right? Like, they have Deontay Banks, who was a first-round pick, was picked one pick after Jordan Addison. I thought he was a good player coming out of Maryland. He was he was somebody I wouldn't have complained about the Vikings taking. taking um, and I, I think he's played okay throughout his, um, you know, he played okay throughout his rookie season, but really they don't have a lot of guys behind that. They had a, jo a Dory Jackson and they actually brought a Dory Jackson back, but they just brought him back last week. So it's kind of an open question of how much a Dory Jackson is going to play in this game. And they really haven't, the Giants haven't been clear on how much he's going to play. Um, Jackson had a quote where he said he could play probably like 50, 60 snaps, but it would be tough. 
um, which to me indicates that he doesn't really feel like he's in game shape, which means he's probably not going to be a significant factor in this game. So outside of him, it's like Cordell Flott, who really has not played all that well in the NFL. He's, he's been in the league for a couple of years. And they would play Drew Phillips, who's a rookie third-round pick, in the slot, right? That seems like really opportunity with, you know, a rookie safety in Tyler Newbin uh, from the University of Minnesota, actually, and a, and a couple other safeties who I'm not too familiar with. Uh, Jason Pinnock was one of them kind of on the back end there. I don't really think there's much to worry about from this Viking secondary. I think Justin Jefferson kind of should feast on this unless they go all out to stop Justin Jefferson, which is something Shane Bowen's defense could do. And then, you know, Jordan Addison should have a great day. You know, the other receiving option should have a great day in that case if Sam Darnold is able to get the ball to them. Um, that becomes the big question because the Giants have Dexter Lawrence. And not only do they have Dexter Lawrence, who was phenomenal a couple years ago, they also they have Leonard Williams. They swapped him out for Brian Burns, who's a very scary edge rusher. Um, Kayvon Thibodeau kind of had a down year last year, you know, was a, was a highly drafted player. Didn't show all that much. Um in his second season, but he could have advanced his game. Um, you know, I, otherwise there aren't too many threats from the Giants and their linebacker level isn't all that great, but Dexter Lawrence is so good that he can kind of wreck a game in and of himself. Like I, I, he can be the Chris Jones like player where Chris Jones kind of took over in that Chiefs Ravens game and had Lamar on the run for, for a high portion of the game. And the Vikings obviously historically in that 2022 game really struggled to block Dexter Lawrence on the interior. He really kind of feasted on Garrett Bradbury as for Cleveland, Ed Ingram, the Vikings interior offensive line. So they'll need to have a better plan to contain him. But if they try too hard to contain him, you're leaving your tackles one-on-one with uh, Brian Burns. And while I, I think very highly of the Vikings tackles, right, I talked about that. I think one of the things that has benefited the Vikings tackles over the past couple of years is the play of Kirk Cousins. Um, Kirk is a very precise quarterback in terms of how he takes his drop depths and where he ends up on his drops, um, you know, on at pretty much every passing place, he's in the correct spot. As a tackle in your head, you know, each play has a specified drop depth, usually based on the number of steps that are in the drop. So you know when it's a three-step drop play that you have to block to like eight yards. You know on a seven-step drop play action play, the quarterback's back foot might hit at 10 yards, and then he hitches up one or two. So you kind of know roughly what angles you need to block at. Brian Burns is an extremely explosive, an extremely bendy edge rusher off the edge. He's got great... Great speed rush. Uh, Christian Derrissaw, actually, one of his first games was against the Panthers and Brian Burns. And Burns absolutely roasted him on a ghost move where he was able to cut eight yards. And then Kirk Cousins steps up in the pocket past Brian Burns. It doesn't get logged as a pressure by PFF. Nobody notices, like, you know, it, it was kind of a negative rep for Christian Derrissaw in that case. I, I think Derrissaw has had more than, I, I will say, our advertised uh, number of those reps where First of all, it's great that he was able to work in coordination with Kirk Cousins and be as dominant as he was because he was able to be a little bit more aggressive and maybe not worry about letting a guy win at 9 or 10 yards past the back of the quarterback. Um, I think that really helped elevate his game. The problem is when you have a quarterback who probably isn't as precise in Sam Darnold, is he going to be able to adjust and now if Sam Darnold's dropping back to nine yards when he should drop back to eight yards, is Christian Derrissaw going to be, get beat around the edge a little bit more? That's kind of an open question that I have heading into the season. I, I don't want it to be an overly negative thing on Derrissaw, right? But the, the angles that he has to block at have changed. So I would love to see him be able to adjust and kind of lock down Brian Burns in this game. That's something kind of that I'm watching for, but it's something that may become a negative for the Vikings, right? So I kind of talked about it. Really, the pass protection is is my biggest concern in this game. They've got a dominant, two dominant players along the defensive line, and the Vikings are going to need to make sure to pass protect against that. If they can't do that, that's when Sam Darnold might need to go in creation mode, avoid things on the, uh, you know, work in muddy pockets. And that's where I have a concern about Darnold, where I talked about he was very clean when he was on rhythm and on time in the preseason. I'm hoping that he has 
improved not only his on rhythm on time stuff, but also his off script stuff and, and dealing with pressure and handling pressure and, and kind of playing more within himself. Um, but this could be an interesting test if the Vikings offensive line is unable to keep up with the Giants defensive line. If they are able to keep up, I, I think this could be like fireworks from the Vikings offense because I don't think the secondary for the Giants is very good. Um, you know, the, the blocking thing, the struggle to block Dexter Lawrence in particular also applies to the run game. Um, he can wreck that single-handedly. Brian Burns is a solid run defender. He's a little bit on the smaller side, so he's kind of easy to move. I don't really have a high opinion on the uh, Giants linebackers either. Uh, so at the end of the day, like, I, I think if they're able to block up Dexter Lawrence, the Vikings should be able to run the ball. But the question is, can you block Dexter Lawrence? Um so if we flip it over to keys on defense, uh, there there's a couple things, right? I think the number one is the very exciting rookie who I absolutely love as a prospect. Like I may have, if I were in charge of the Giants, said, okay, like I do absolutely love Malik Neighbors, but we cannot go into the season without a plan, uh, without a future plan, you know, to take over for Daniel Jones, right? So it's an interesting question. I think, you know, the Giants kind of took the quote-unquote safe option in their mind, right, which is get a great player in Malik Neighbors and then worry about the quarterback position later. But at the end of the day, we'll see how much of an impact he's able to have with poor quarterback play, I think, from Daniel Jones. Um, obviously, he's, he's an incredibly fast receiver. He's a great vertical threat. Uh, Daniel Jones is a great vertical thrower, but the Vikings with an older corner in Stephon Gilmore, with a smaller corner in Byron Murphy, you know, aren't necessarily built, I think, to play single man coverage on a player like Malik Neighbors. So I think in this game, we're still probably going to see the Brian Flores, like Max Blitz, Max Zone, try to confuse Daniel Jones as much as possible, try to get him to get the ball out quick. Um, or if he's holding on to the ball, confuse what he's seeing on the back end so he kind of makes boneheaded decisions, maybe has to hold on to the ball a little bit more, allow your pass rush to get there. Um, which makes the second key being containing Daniel Jones, right? I mean, we all remember the 2022 playoff game where Daniel Jones just ran all over the Vikings because they couldn't put together a contained plan to save their life, even though I, if they had listened to me, they would have noticed that they really struggled to contain him in the in the regular season matchup, and it was it was something they really needed to iron out. Or they actually did a pretty good job, but it was something they needed to iron out and make sure they were still doing in the playoff game. He was able to run all over them with his scrambling, and that's what allowed the Giants' offense to to move the ball so well in that game. Um, so having a good rush contain plan, which we've talked about a, a, quite a few times on this podcast, but there's a layering to the way you rush. If somebody rushes wide around the tackle, right, if, da if Dallas Turner is trying to do a speed rush and he goes wide around the tackle, that tackle and you're just kind of pushing from your defensive tackles, there can be a wide swath of space for the quarterback to run through there. You need to have somebody underneath like a Harrison Phillips who's kind of just pushing, 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 trying to push the depth of the pocket, disengage and move into that space as Dallas Turner goes wide around the edge. Or your, ta or your edge rusher from the other side, should go low, right? So he charges up field and then cuts back underneath the tackle who's blocking him to try to get the quarterback who steps up in the pocket or try try to get out there. Uh, putting a spy like a Ivan Pace, I think, would be a great spy for Daniel Jones. Putting a spy on Jones could also be a solution to containing him scrambling. But, you know, it, it's something the Vikings need to make sure they're sound in, right? Because they do a lot of heavy blitzing, a lot of heavy offensive line looks, you need to make sure that you're containing your rush lane so the quarterback can't find the room to escape. Um, and then the final thing I have is just make your tackles. Like, the Giants' run game isn't particularly impressive. Their offensive line, I, I don't think, is very good. Um, they have Andrew Thomas, who's great as the left tackle. John Michael Schmitz, uh, also a Minnesota Gopher, was very bad last year. They kind of brought in patchwork guys like Greg Van Roten and Jermaine Illuminor, who both started for the Raiders last year, actually did a pretty good job. But at the end of the day, they're like journeyman veterans who aren't really quality starters. So I, you know, I kind of feel about them the same way I feel a little bit about the Vikings interior offensive line, where really they don't have a lot going for them. And they also brought in John Runyon. I'm sorry, as well. So they've had three new starters on this offensive line. And, you know, there's 
got to be time for them to mesh together. And also, I don't think any of the three players they brought in were particularly good. Like, Illuminar is the the best of them, I would say, and he was kind of a mediocre starter. I honestly didn't get the John Runyon contract at all. Like, I didn't think he was a very good player for the Packers. And Greg Van Roten is kind of the the bottom-of-the-barrel journeyman veteran that you bring in, like a, like a Mason Cole or like a Jesse Davis to me or like a Chris Reed to me. For the Vikings historically, so it's it's really not all that inspiring of a uh, of a offensive line group, which means that Devin Singletary, who's like a okay running back, like he'll do what you need him to do. You know, he's a step up from Alex Madison in that he can actually execute what he's seeing in front of him, but he's not a game breaking player like Saquon Barkley was. So. The Vikings just need to make sure they're making their tackles consistently in the run game and also in the pass game, right? Because Malik Neighbors, while being an explosive downfield threat, was also a phenomenal yak threat at LSU. And I think, you know, Wandale Robinson and some of the other Giants receivers are, are more yards after catch guys. I I shouldn't necessarily say that. Like, Darius Slayton has been, excuse me, a, a pretty efficient deep threat. But... At the end of the day, they are, uh, you know, I, I think the damage could come if the Vikings aren't able to make their tackles when the Giants receivers make plays, right? Making plays after the catch rather than getting beat downfield just because Jones isn't a, a great downfield passer. Um, so that's kind of preview of the Giants. Um, got through pretty much everything I wanted to hear. Thank you guys for sticking around, for listening to the Kindred Skulls podcast. I am Matt Fries. Um, Nick, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Fries Football. Nick Olson, hopefully we'll see him back. You can follow him at Nick Olson NFL. We are at Kindred Skulls on Twitter. We are available on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, also on YouTube. Thanks very much for listening, and Skull Vikings. Oh, another baby. first round corner wouldn't do us any harm. Oh, another first round corner wouldn't do us any harm. Oh, another first round corner wouldn't do us any harm. And we'll all cheer on behind. And we'll score.